but I am the mother of seven children. And as the mother of seven children, I have to tell you, when you have children, each child comes with its own set of needs and its own personality. And every child's educational needs are very different. We have a one size fits all, let's in, in New Jersey particularly, where more than 50% of the property taxes that we pay go to the local school district. And the property taxes are the highest in the nation, which means that even if children, if parents wish to accommodate their children's needs that may be different or may, maybe they require a more enriched environment, whatever it is, there is no money left. Can I pause for a second and, and just note that uh, we got Brian on here who's getting uh, Congressman Massey on and our typical lineup includes like homeless people that believe in Bigfoot. <laughs> Welcome to The Brian Nichols Show, your source for common sense politics on the We Are Libertarians Network. The Brian Nichols Show is the fastest growing liberty podcast that brings together people from all means of political thought as we seek to have meaningful conversations about the issues you care about. At The Brian Nichols Show, our goal is to leave the audience educated, enlightened, and informed. And now your host, Brian Nichols. Well, happy Sunday there, folks. Brian Nichols here on The Brian Nichols Show. Thank you for joining us on another fun-filled episode. And today, we are, of course, continuing our awesome Sunday Candidate Highlight Series. Today, I am joined by one Eve Brownstein. Now, Eve is running as Lieutenant Governor for New Jersey. And it's a great chance because, obviously, we've already met her uh, her uh, running mate, one Greg Mealy, who is running for governor of New Jersey. So a great chance to meet Eve, learn more about her path to liberty and why she thinks we need a libertarian takeover here in New Jersey to help make things more free. So that being said, on to the show, Eve Brownstein here on The Brian Nichols Show. Thank you very much for having me, Brian. Absolutely. Eve, thank you so much for joining the program. And uh, it's great. We're continuing with this long standing tradition, it seems now, over the past uh, few months of having folks from the great state of New Jersey who are fighting the, the battle here for liberty. And Eve, you're, you're running here as a libertarian for, as I mentioned, Lieutenant Governor. So let's first introduce yourself, Eve, to the Brian Nichols Show audience and your path to liberty. How did you find yourself here in this very fun and strange libertarian world we find ourselves in? Well, um, I, I, it's it's been a it's been a longer road for me. I, you can tell by my accent. I wasn't born here, so I was born in what is now Zimbabwe, and then I was raised mostly in South Africa. And in South Africa, a lot of um, personal liberties were not uh, respected, and and that made me angry as a teenager. Um, but I came here as a very young adult and I got married and my husband had a run in with the IRS. <laughs> and I realized that government oppression happens even in countries where liberty is supposed to be the cornerstone of what that company, that country represents. So I left one country mm. with bureaucratic stuff and I came here. Um, and then I discovered Harry Brown, <laughs> and I'm a Harry, Harry Brown. Brown libertarian. <laughs> that, you know what? That's great to hear because I don't get to hear Harry Brown often as the entry for libertarianism. Because a lot of the folks here, the the person, of course, is Ron Paul, right? That's the uh, the the more noted person now for the more I say active uh, folks here in the liberty movement. So, what was it about Harry Brown coming from? A, and it is obviously an area that experienced apartheid. You mentioned South Africa. Right. So I'm sure that there must have been things you were experiencing that maybe led you to want to look towards these libertarian solutions versus what has been presented out there as the alternative option, the the, the red team, the blue team, the, the Republicans and Democrats. And who can tell the difference, really, right? Um, I... You used to listen to Harry Brown was on the radio a lot. I lived in Los Angeles. Harry Brown was on the radio a lot. And he had a way of really making it clear how government interfered with liberties and w alternative ways in which you could have the, the society that you wanted without terribly uh, oppressive government um, 
restrictions and, and government oversight. And having come from a place where, you know, when I grew up in South Africa, we had censorship, we had separated uh, communities. So to me, the idea of leaving it up to government or trusting government with how you live your life just didn't seem to be an option. And Harry Brown had the perfect way of, of explaining alternatives that, uh, you know, his famous line of, you know, government will break your legs and then give you a crutch and say, you wouldn't be able to walk without us. But of course, I could walk before you broke my legs. Um, and that's a famous one. But he had other, he has a lot of other ideas that really appealed to me. So you're running for Lieutenant Governor in New Jersey. Now we've had Greg on the program. We've also had Nicholas Magner, who's running for assembly in New Jersey. So we've heard some of the issues. Yes, thumbs up indeed. We've heard <laughs> indeed though, the issues that I think not only are specific to New Jersey, but some underlying issues that across the board we've been hearing in the United States, looking at the lockdowns, for example, that is at the top of people's mind. Healthcare is at the top of people's mind as well, right. because right. in an era of COVID, when you look at the healthcare infrastructure and they look at the, the hospital bills, in some cases, it's tens of thousands of dollars putting families into complete financial ruin. So we've seen some of these issues that have been discussed across the board. And, and candidly, we've been having them for the past year, especially in this yes. era of COVID. But Eve, I would love to hear maybe some of the issues that you're focusing on specifically as a lieutenant governor candidate. What are some of the issues that you're seeing uh, in your your particular uh, maybe frame of, of uh, reference or particular conversations that you're having out there with the New Jersey uh, voters? So uh, I, I will tell you, I ran for office before. And so I always had the platform of um, one is school choice, which I know uh, Greg is very, very clear on, but I am the mother of seven children. And as the mother of seven children, I have to tell you, when you have children, each child comes with its own set of needs and its own personality. And every child's educational needs are very different. We have a one size fits all, let's in, in New Jersey, particularly where more than 50% of the property taxes that we pay go to the local school district and the property taxes are the highest in the nation, which means that even if children, if parents wish to accommodate their children's needs that may be different or may, maybe they require a more enriched environment, whatever it is, there is no money left for those parents to do that. So I've always been a proponent. One of the things that, that Greg agrees with me is that the, it's fine if, if, if funding children's education, as parents, we want to do that, but we want that money to follow our children and to go to the school where we think our children's needs are best met. And that is something very near and dear to my heart because, yeah, as I said, seven kids, seven different personalities, seven different needs. And well, and how special is it for you to have the opportunity to see that firsthand as a mom, you get to see seven very individual people and 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 they're going to have very seven individual lives now granted they're probably going to have a, a little bit of a rhyme to each other's lives because of their shared experiences but the fact that despite those shared experiences they're still able to have very unique qualifiers or very unique identifiers that make them who they are and, and that's such a blessing that speaks to the ideas that we talk about all the time, the idea of spontaneous odor. I, I was just talking, oh my goodness, I forget the conversation I was having uh, recently, but we were talking about school choice out in uh, the great state of California, which has been decimated recently. But you look at the spontaneous order in like, even cities like San Francisco, where they're saying, hey, the schools are being shut down. And all of a sudden we have a, a demand where we want kids to get educated. And there's teachers out there who are looking to teach and parents who are looking to work together and have these almost crowdsourced solutions just naturally arise. And it speaks to the value, I think, of what we talk about every single day. And instead of just talking about it in theory, now we can point directly to the, the successes that we're seeing happen 
right before our eyes, especially, and this is maybe one of the, the positives. I was listening to a show in ironically just kind of worked on ironically is the right term, but uh, it just happened to work out that it was from Thanksgiving time. And it was a podcast talking about thankfulness and thinking about the things that we can be really thankful for it, despite the hardships. And you look in an era of COVID, I think with making people so, so skeptical and rightfully right. so of the, the, the very, you know, the very entrusted government institutions we've had for decades and if not generations, now people are starting to lift the veil off and ask a little bit more questions. And as a sales guy, that just makes me smile from ear to ear. Yeah. Well, I actually lived in California for 23 years. I'm very familiar with some of the issues that Californians face. And I'll be honest with you, we face them in New Jersey too. Uh, and it's particularly with how this, the whole lockdown thing happened and schools closed and parents were stuck. I am a, an HR director. I've been in the human resources for over 30 years. It was so difficult for working parents who now were working from home. And now they have to figure out how they're going to accommodate a new schedule for their children who are in the same house, sitting at desks. And those schedules, those kids, kids schedules, they weren't the same. Those children were not in school the same amount of time right. that they had been. So for parents, that was particularly difficult to adjust for that. And how about this? Like, again, let's look at the positives though. How about the opportunity for parents to see what was going on in the classroom. I heard from so many folks, especially up in, in so I'm originally from upstate New York. It, it's a very more conservative rural area. And the just expectation was that's not being taught in our schools. We hear about it on TV. It's far out there. You know, that They're not trying to go after kids and indoctrinate kids. And then as soon as the kids were forced home, and they have to now enter the classroom in Zoom, and the parents get to see what's actually being taught, that made the red flags go up even more, and I think it even sparks a conversation to go forward even faster. Yes, well, I, I raised very independent thinkers, as you can imagine, because I have a very you know wider variety of experiences. And many of my kids, they're all adults now, but when, particularly when they were in high school, they used to, you know, it, at around election times, the teachers would say, well, who are you, vote, who are you going to vote for in this election, uh, Democrat or Republican? And my kids would say, well, what about the Libertarian candidate? You haven't covered the Libertarian <laughs> candidate, you know, God which would spark it. this whole conversation. So there, there isn't enough information in the schools about, the opportunities and the choices and the and and things that they never ever cover i it, it's really very limited and our children deserve more information not less information not this restricted by the book tiny little bit of information that they, that the schools are willing to give them they need broader experiences. They need more information. They need to know about a lot more than they do. And and I think yeah. that that's something that that parents have a choice. You know, when you have a choice of where to send your kids to school, you can look at that. Yeah. Eve, uh, let's kind of do a little segue because we just saw a recent conversation being brought up here from a national perspective. And that was one about uh, paid uh, ma maternity leave. And, and I'm, I'm curious, the libertarian argument for that, what what do the libertarians say? Is, is it a matter of the government trying to provide the service or do we look for the private sector or, or private institutions to, to fill that void? Well, I think everybody wants paid maternity leave because you don't want to lose your pay because you're on maternity leave. But here's the thing. The government takes that out of your paycheck and doesn't give you an option to decide how to manage that. And that, I think, from a libertarian standpoint, is, is not a good thing. Uh, when you take, so for example, now when we, and I can tell you about this because I'm in, a, in HR, um, they only pay 65% of what you could earn if you were working full time. So instead wow. of, <laughs> yes. So yes, you go on maternity disability leave. And I think we all agree that it's a wonderful thing to be able to, to do that and have that opportunity. 
but they but they're taking money out of your paycheck to fund it so you don't get to decide how that money is managed and if we've seen anything from social security we know when we give them government money to manage they don't give you a return that's anything like the return you would have if you managed it yourself so mm. i'm all for programs that can be set up for people to be able to fund that stuff themselves and not have it come out of your paycheck and not only give you 65% of what your pay would be. I mean, that's still a cut. It's nice to have paid maternity benefits, but if I'm only getting 65% of what I was earning when I was working full time, then I'm going to feel pressured to go back to work a lot faster regardless of, of how that works. So um, maybe if you gave me that money back, I could invest it in a way that would give me 100% of my earnings for a period of time so I wouldn't feel so stressed. You know, so, and yeah, that's, that, to me, that's the libertarian <laughs> solution. It just, and I, I say this often on my show and I always throw my hands up and I'm like, it just makes sense, right? And it, it, it drives me crazy because if we all just kind of were in this world of like, okay, can we just sit down and have a rational conversation about what's not working and what we can look at as some possible solutions and, and maybe make some hard decisions, but acknowledge that we can start to build some alternatives out there. And it's almost right now, I think, important for us to go out and start to build these alternatives. So one thing, let's kind of do a little bit more of a turn towards your professional experience. I'd love to maybe dig into some things you've experienced that just catch you off guard because I'm sure there's this, and we see this right now. I had a conversation with a, a friend of the show, Kenny Cody. We talked about wokeism in, in not just politics, but in corporate America and you're in HR. I'm, I'm sure you must see it permeate through. Can you kind of maybe dig into your personal experience in terms of this narrative that maybe has changed from a corporate level that the, the, this, I think the argument before that corporations were more of these big infrastructures for the right. Is that still the case or are we seeing that narrative shift? So I, I think what you're seeing is that there is a demand because of social media and I, and, and I teach this when I teach my, I teach HR too, uh, because of social media, you, we know things a lot faster than we would have before. We know who the bad players are out there in terms of corporations. And so I, I do think that there is a shift that corporations need to be more responsible towards their employer, employees and that they need to treat them with respect and they need to be good stewards of the environment. They need to, they need to care about the communities that they're in. And I think that personally, I think that's a good thing. I think it's good when it's driven by what the public expects from a company and what a public uh, demands from from company that may be in its community. And, and I always say work is very personal. So we go to work because we want to provide for our families. At the same time, we want to feel, we, if we have bad experiences, because work is a lot of the day, if we had bad experiences, that affects us deeply. And, and it affects us on the most personal levels. So I think that we know things a lot faster. Cor you know, people always say to me, well, the libertarian solution is corporations can do whatever they want. Actually, the, the libertarian solution is not that corporations can do whatever they want. It's that people will demand more when they know that they can. And what we've done is we've put it in the in the hands of government to say, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. It hampers a lot of things. For example, I'll give you a quick example. We have uh, equal pay. In New Jersey, you, you know, a woman has to get paid the same year. You can't, you can't discriminate with pay. It, it's it, the equal pay for substantially similar work. Fine. Well, how, we, how does that hamper anybody? You think it's a great thing? I have been in a situation where a woman has asked to be paid more than a man for a role. And I have had to go back to her and say, the men in our organization get less than that. I can't pay you more. So I can't negotiate for her to get what she's asked for because I now have to pay. So, you know, 
it works both ways and I've been in that situation and it, it pains me when I'm in that situation because I've always said what we earn, we have to determine what we earn based on what our personal needs are and that's different for everybody. And I can't tell you what, what you can earn or what you should be earning. You have to tell me what you need for the work that you're going to be doing. So, yeah, it sounds it sounds better than than it actually can sometimes be in practice. It's surprising when you hear the unintended consequences that. Then I actually was talking about this before in a, a previous episode where intentions alone don't matter. You we have to look actually at the outcome of these policies, and and you get to experience it firsthand, Eve, it, to see just how the the good intention policies often do have these backward unintended consequences. So what would you give as a prescription? You know, as if we're going to play the role of doctor here and in using your expertise, what would be a good way to help maybe remedy this current problem that we've identified where these unintended consequences are now creeping in and causing more harm than good? So Every employer has access to, to advertise their, what they offer employees. And in HR, we often refer to that as being an employer of choice. Everybody wants to be an employer of choice because then people apply to your organization. They want to apply to your organization and they actively look for those organizations. I personally think that there's no reason for employers not to advertise all of the benefits and all of the salaries that they pay and to put it out there and say, this is what we pay people for our roles. This is, this is, you know, the, these are the benefits we offer. This is why you want to come and work for us. That would be competing on the open market. Yes. I like that because so I'm, I'm smiling. I, my day job, I'm a sales executive, but I lead a, a sales team. And I mean, I made a point I don't care about whether you have a college degree or not because that doesn't tell me what value you bring to the role. Now, my team is mostly focusing on prospecting for, you know, out, outside opportunities for my, my sales guys. And that doesn't, you know, if you went to a certain school and you got a certain grade in a certain class, that doesn't tell me if you can take a very maybe hard to understand idea and be able to convey it so your average person understands that that piece of paper doesn't show me that that piece of paper is a piece of paper and it used to represent value but now to your point as we've added more and more of these various levels of bureaucracy and various levels of, of law and, and legalese the piece of paper now doesn't really represent what it used to represent and i think we're seeing that with a lot of roles in certain companies they don't really represent what they used to represent anymore <laughs> Well, it's interesting you say that. I always tell my kids, look, I have I have a master's degree, so I have degrees. But I always tell my kids, it's the, the degree, where you get the degree from or the degree or the education, whatever, that doesn't matter. It's what you actually do with it that counts. And, you know, you don't have to have a big fancy degree to be a very effective person in what you're doing. And there are lots of ways to learn how to do things that don't involve going to college. Personally, I my college degrees really helped me because I like to teach and it's required in upper education, you know, in higher ed that you have advanced degrees. But I was doing HR for a very long time without a degree. And I believe I was just as effective. So, you know, I, I, I'm, I think that, that we need to look at what people bring. We talk about the employ, employee, the value the employee brings to the role. Employees bring value in many, many ways. And it doesn't necessarily mean they have to have a degree in order to do that. But they do need to be effective. And an employer needs to be able to say, hey, you're not you're just not meeting the standard and then not going through a hundred, you know, layers of, of legal stuff to be able to separate from that employee. And if that's not working out and there's not always a fit, we always talk about fit, you know, some, not everybody's a fit for the role, but when a person's a fit for the role, I don't, I don't think it matters what their particular education is. If they're a fit, they're a fit. And if they're not, they're not. Amen. And we, we can take that 
to the Capitol in New Jersey, Eve, because we want you to now be the next lieutenant governor for New Jersey. So as we're getting ready to wrap up here, let's make that final pitch. What would you say to the voters out there who are maybe a little weary of looking at the libertarians? They really haven't seen maybe too many elections where we've maybe gotten some skins on the wall, but we're making more of a name for ourselves. So why should they look at us and maybe make that, uh, that choice this coming election to pull the trigger for the Libertarian Party? Well, I think you should always pull the trigger for the Libertarian Party. And the, and the reason is because Libertarians really do care what you want and what you, and how to get that to you. I don't see that in the other parties. The other parties seem to be motivated by getting into office and staying there no matter what it takes and not being concerned about their constituents. I think libertarians, because we work so hard to get there, when we get there, we know we got there because of you and not because of huge funding from this other part, the, the party, and, and, and we're not being sponsored by outside interests. It, you know, you're going to get a candidate who really cares about what's important to you and what needs to be done in government to deliver that to you. I like it, Eve. I like it a lot. And that's why we need to make sure we direct people to both you and Greg who are doing amazing work. So as always, folks, I will include the links to find both Eve and Greg's uh, campaign in the show notes. Eve Brownstein, thank you so much for all you're doing and helping support the message of liberty. And thank you for joining The Brian Nichols Show. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Alrighty, folks, that's going to wrap up my conversation with Eve Brownstein. She is running for lieutenant governor here in New Jersey. I say here as if I'm in New Jersey. I live right next door to New Jersey and I work in New Jersey. So I kind of feel like I'm part of New Jersey. So, and, and by the way, half of my team is from New Jersey here. So uh, I definitely am, am empathetic more towards New Jersey and, and what we're seeing here happen. And thank God there's a great liberty movement in the greater New Jersey area. So thank you to the great team in New Jersey fighting the good fight. Uh, you know, I, I have to give a special shout out to one Frankie who has been not only leading the great fight over in New Jersey, but helping us here at the Brian Nichols show. So thank you for wearing many different hats, Frankie. And, and with that being said, folks, thank you for helping support these awesome candidates who are joining us here on the Sunday Candidate Highlight Series. If you have not had the chance yet to go ahead and check out our other New Jersey candidates, well, we had Greg Neely on the show as well as Nicholas Magner and then uh, Michael Torres, who he's not running for office, uh, but he he did run for office and he's got some pretty uh, big aspirations, I would say, coming down the road. So great to get to know Michael and his amazing work in New Jersey as well. And with that being said, folks, I'm going to ask you to do me a solid because we want to continue to help share these conversations, share these stories that we're hearing here from these awesome Liberty candidates, please go ahead and share today's episode. I'm going to go ahead and ask you to share it and, and tag uh, Eve as, as well as tagging yours truly. And you can tag me at B Nichols Liberty, Twitter, Facebook, minds.com and parlor.com. That's right. At B Nichols Liberty. And folks, you've heard about it. If you want to join the Brian Nichols show Alliance, the, the awesome group of folks who are making things happen. That's right. We are not just talking about libertarians being right, but we are talking about solutions that we are solving when we see the problems that we uh, see out there. So number one, if you are interested in our brand new ebook, it is four things, four easy steps you can implement right now to help sell Liberty to friends and family. And if you go over to uh, briannicholsshow.com forward slash Liberty Friends ebook, because I accidentally said the wrong uh, link in my last episode. So sorry, folks. It's uh, briannicholsshow.com forward slash Liberty Friends ebook. That will bring you right to the free download for this awesome new ebook. And yes, it is in fact four easy steps that you can take. I'm a sales executive, folks. This is what we do every single day here in, in my greater telecommunications cybersecurity industry I find myself in. So if you're interested in learning the very easy steps that you can take right now, again, it's briannicholsshow.com forward slash Liberty Friends ebook. And folks, if you really enjoy it and you're like, hey, you know what, this ebook, it's it's taught me a lot. I think I, there's a lot more out there I could learn. 
and I want to learn more. Where can you go ahead and learn more? Well, you can head over to the Patreon, patreon.com forward slash The Brian Nichols Show, and you can sign up to be either a, an entry-level sales rep, or you can be an account executive, $5 or $10 a month per uh, per Patreon. But also, every single Patreon will get one of these awesome Don't Hurt People, Don't Take People Stuff bumper sticker, and the patrons have been lining up, and I'm so excited. We're getting the, uh, the, the patron... Uh, Patrons, by the way, time out really quick. Patrons, you are getting uh, your bumper stickers here in the mail, hopefully in the next week or so. Things have been crazy over the past month as we've, we've been growing things here at the show. But hey, by the way, I still I, I still have to focus on my day job, guys, obviously. So it uh, definitely takes um, some time to try ahead, go ahead and get all this stuff accomplished. So definitely be looking into your, your uh, yeah, I almost said inboxes. Man, we're, we're definitely uh, getting rid of the old ways of doing things. That's why it's so important, I think, that we're talking about uh, you know what we're doing here at the Brian Nichols Show, talking about different ways to get in people's top of mind. And definitely this bumper sticker is going to give people top of mind. They're going to be asking some questions, piquing some interest. So if you're interested, again, to join the Patreon, $5, $10 a month, whatever it may be, I greatly appreciate it. And I, I sincerely want you to uh, feel that you are getting value of what we're doing here at the Brian Nichols Show. And in return, I will be giving you guys some value back. So again, head over to the Patreon. Uh, it's patreon.com forward slash the Brian Nichols Show. Coming up here on Monday. Monday, Monday, we are joined by Weya, Nine, and Jan Jan, and we are discussing the tragedy that is happening right now over in Myanmar. Uh, now, this is something, and I'm not sure about you, you turn on the news, discussed what? Maybe at the last... Something happening over there. Well, this is something that we need to be discussing more, just like what we saw with the Hong Kong protests. This is a human rights issue. This is an issue of trying to defend individual liberty, personal autonomy, and I think it's an issue that we libertarians need to be paying more attention about. So coming up here on Monday, that conversation, it's a roundtable conversation and definitely one I cannot encourage you guys to share enough. So if you have not had the chance yet, head over to Apple Podcasts, give us that five-star rating and review. Tell folks why you get value from the program. I see the tens of thousands of downloads every single month. So tell me, folks, what value do you get from the program? Share it with the world. Remember, stories are what help sell liberty. We just had Matt Kibbe on the show, and that's what we talked about. So with that being said, folks, thank you so much for joining us on another fun-filled episode of The Brian Nichols Show. With that being said, Brian Nichols signing off for Eve Brownstein. We'll see you Monday. Thanks for listening to The Brian Nichols Show. Find more episodes at briannicholsshow.com.